All right, well, here's a list I'm willing to bet a lot of you have wanted to see updated for a while now. Uh, last time I did this was right after my 50th video. I've covered a lot of different movies since then, some of them good, some of them bad. And today we are going to be concentrating on the bad ones. Now, uh, if you haven't seen my last video, my criteria for these movies is I'm not necessarily judging them on how technically bad they are. It's more it's more just based on their entertainment value. So that means you're not going to see any so bad they're good movies on here like uh like Miami Connection's not going to be on this list. Uh Challenge of the Tiger, uh Star Crash. Those are movies where you know, they're really cheesy and they're technically bad movies, but they're awesomely bad movies. They're they're really entertaining and funny bad movies. Uh with this one um the biggest thing for me is I think the worst thing a movie can be is boring. And that is what a lot of these movies are. They are just dull. Um, nothing happens. There's nothing interesting about them. The other thing is uh, it's either that or they're obnoxious. Like they're movies that just I, I felt uncomfortable watching them. They were just hard to get through. Um, also with the last list, that was a top nine. I considered doing that again, but uh, there's a lot of new additions that I needed to make room for, so it's going to be a top ten this time. So without, uh, without stalling any further, this is the Worst Movies i Reviewed 100th Episode Edition. <sighs> Number ten, Gamera Super Monster. All right, now... As a lot of you know, I'm not a big Gamera fan. I've never been a big Gamera fan. When I was a kid, it was all about Godzilla. And the fact that this was the very first Gamera movie I ever saw definitely didn't help. Now, with the other original Gamera movies, they're, you know, they're just kind of harmless, silly monster movies about a giant flying turtle that's the friend to all children, which is kind of creepy sounding, but, you know, whatever. And then you get to this movie. It's the first Gamera movie that they made in nine years. Uh, I think the last one was in 71. This one was made in 1980. And they decided to have him come back with one of the laziest, just most ill-conceived movies you can possibly think of. It's basically, when I say in the video that it's basically the equivalent to the Gamera equivalent to Godzilla's Revenge, I wasn't kidding. Um, in fact, I think it might even be a little bit worse because... Uh, Godzilla's Revenge actually had more new footage, more new monster footage anyway than this does. Um, it also had Godzilla's son talking, so kind of a trade-off there. But yeah, it's just, it's basically the equivalent to like a clip show, you know, those episodes of sitcoms that everybody hates because they're just recycling shit you've already seen before. Uh, they took all the monster scenes from some of the old Gamera movies, made some new plot about some you know, superhero ladies that don't even do anything. Like, they're just, mo mostly they're just standing around going like, we don't have any weapons, we can't do anything. Well, then you're shitty superheroes, aren't you? Um, and about a little boy, it's kind of ambiguous whether any of this is real or if he's just imagining it. Um, it's, like I said, even in the storytelling, it's kind of lazy. They're kind of trying to have it both ways. And, yeah, that's, that's the main word that can describe this movie, is just lazy. They have... I think it's like two minutes of new Gamera footage, and he looks like a Macy's Day balloon for most of it. Uh, most of the other new stuff is just the stuff with the superhero ladies, and then the aliens coming down, which is a Star Destroyer. It's just, it's straight up a Star Destroyer. They don't even try to hide it. I've done some Star Wars knockoffs on here. They're a little more sly. This one, nope, they just copy a Star Destroyer. They don't even give a shit. Just put it in there. Star Wars was popular. Just put it in. And, yeah, there is, I think there's a reason that Gamera didn't return to movie screens for, I think it was 15 years after this. And to, their, to the series' credit, when he did come back, it was actually good. Um, I say at the end of the video, the three, uh, the three newer Gamera movies they made after this, those are actually good monster movies because they actually put some effort into it and actually took the character seriously and actually tried to do a good job. With this one, they just took some old stock footage, slapped it all together, did some, you know, they ripped off Star Wars and Superman because those movies were popular and then they hoped kids would eat it up. Uh, I was not one of those kids. Uh, I can't remember how old I was when I saw it, but I was really young. I saw it on, uh, I think it was TBS or something like that. 
but even then, like, even though this was the first Gamera movie I ever saw, even then I was going like, something's, something's not right here. Something's, uh, there's something wrong with this movie. And after that, I had no interest in really seeing any of the other Gamera movies. I didn't, uh, I didn't try and seek them out. I just stuck with Godzilla. So, uh, yeah, we can blame Gamera Super Monster for that. <sighs> Number nine, The Dark. Now, this is a golden oldie from the last list, so I'll try not to repeat myself too much here, but this movie, more than probably any of the others on this list, represents wasted potential. Because with a lot of the other movies that I'm going to talk about here, they were kind of doomed from the start. With this one, there was... It started out as sort of a good idea that could have been good, or at least decent, and then it's like they just tried to do everything along the way to fuck it up, and we ended up with this horse shit. Um, first mistake, originally it was supposed to be directed by Toby Hooper, he's the guy who made Texas Chainsaw Massacre, and I'm not exactly sure what the story was, I think he had an argument with the producers or something, and he left after a week or two weeks or something like that. So they replaced him with Bud Cardos, and uh, right off the bat, you're, you're taking the guy who directed the Texas Chainsaw Massacre and replacing him with the guy who made Kingdom of the Spiders, so great job there. And then, of course, the other big mistake they make is they changed it so that the monster's an alien because Star Wars made money, so if we add something space-related to this movie, that means it'll make money, right? And <laughs> it's just... You could tell they put almost no effort into the changes um, the only indication we get that it's an alien is there's that text crawl at the beginning that says, like, what if we were alone in the universe? And then there's, like, a, a shot of a falling star, and then that's it. You're just supposed to, you're just supposed to guess that the monster is an alien at that point. Um, originally, I've heard different things about what it was originally supposed to be. I've heard, the most popular one is that it was supposed to be a zombie, but I've also heard that it was supposed to be a uh, resurrected Confederate soldier. I guess that's still a zombie, but uh, another one is uh, it was like a deformed child that was kept chained up in his house until he was an adult, and then he escapes and goes on a killing rampage. But the point is, it wasn't supposed to be an alien. But then to chase a trend, they decided to change it, and the only thing they changed is that they added those those stupid laser effects for all the kill scenes where you can tell they were added in later in those just god-awful superimposed explosions. You know, it looks like an effect they put in one of my videos. Those those moments are actually pretty funny. That's th that's the closest this movie comes to being like a so bad it's good movie. Those actually made me chuckle the first time I saw them, and then at the end when it's uh, blasting the cops. Those moments it kind of comes close to being a so bad it's good movie, but those moments are way too f few and far between. Uh, most of the rest of the movie is just boring. Um, and that's a shame because they have some good actors in it. They got uh, Richard Jekyll is a good character actor, uh, William Devane, but they're just, they're given nothing to do. Like, they're, their characters are just nothing. Like, uh, William Devane's a guy who just got out of prison, and uh, Richard Jekyll's the cop who put him there, and their whole attitude is like, I don't like you. Yeah, well, I don't like you. And that's it. They, you know, they don't have any sort of arc or anything like that. They don't change at all. They just start there and they end there. There's no interesting plot developments. There's uh, William Devane's romance with Kathy Lee Crosby that, does, that goes nowhere. I don't give a fuck. I don't care about any of this. And just useless characters like the, the psychic lady who her whole role is like she goes to the police and says, somebody's gonna get murdered. Okay, can you give us any details? No. Alright, well thanks for that. And yeah, she does absolutely nothing uh, you could cut that whole character out and it wouldn't affect the plot at all. Uh, scenes that go nowhere, there's that one scene in the parking garage where um, he's walking alone and then he thinks he hears something and then he gets scared and he starts running and he does that stupid slow motion six million dollar man run. I didn't change anything in the movie there. He actually, there actually is a slow motion shot like that. And then he gets in an elevator and you learn, oh nothing was there. No Nothing happened. There is no danger this entire time, making that scene completely fucking pointless. And that's what that's what 80% of the movie is. It's just characters that don't do anything, scenes that go nowhere. So all we're left with are the kill scenes, and like I said, the laser effect is kind of funny. But other than that, there's just... Once you see it like two or three times, the novelty kind of wears off. 
Um, we get the one like decapitation kill, but even then that's kind of like a, it's like a very PG rated decapitation. Uh, so it's, it's like a horror movie that's too afraid to go all out with the horror and the soundtrack sounds like a bunch of snakes hissing the title. And this is a case where it's a movie that's trying to chase a trend to make money, but doesn't know what to do with it. And it, it doesn't know how stupid it's making everything. Like the fact that this thing's an alien makes no goddamn sense. He's wearing jeans and a denim jacket, but he's supposed to be an alien. And the only reason they did that was because Star Wars was a big hit. Like, you know what? Jaws was a big hit. Why don't you make him a shark that learned how to walk on land? And then he mugged the guy at a Led Zeppelin concert and stole his clothes. Makes about as much sense as what they did. Actually, it makes a little bit more sense because Jaws was actually a scary movie. Star Wars wasn't. So why would you try and make your horror movie like a movie that wasn't scary? Like, just, ugh. People... <sighs> People chasing a trend in the hopes of getting a few bucks, and wow, did it ever fucking backfire on them. Yeah, just a lot of the problems I'm describing here, like with the characters, th those sound like problems with the original script. So even if, uh, even if Toby Hooper directed it and they didn't change the monster to be an alien, uh, I'm still not sure it would have been good, but it probably would have been better than what we got, which was just crap. Uh... Number 8. Korean Tron, or Savior of the Earth, or whatever. Now, um, none of the Turkish movies are going to be on this list. If, if this was being judged purely on production values, yeah, they're probably the worst, but I can't say I was ever bored watching any of them. Like, even though I had no idea what the hell was going on, they were, they were kind of entertaining. They you know, they were crazy enough that they kept your attention. And this movie, even though it's not Turkish, but it's another, like, foreign ripoff of a popular movie. And I don't know what it is, but this one, this one was a lot harder to sit through. Maybe it's because it was actually in English and I could understand what was going on. But a lot of this movie just annoyed the shit out of me. Um, first of all, you've got the voice acting, which is some of the worst voice acting I've ever heard in my entire life. I've heard that, uh, somebody told me that Joseph Lai, the guy who produced this, that for the dubbing, the English dubbing, he'd just get people off the street and get them to dub it. I believe it, because that's what it sounds like. It sounds like, it sounds like they ordered a pizza to the studio and said to the delivery boy, like, hey, you want to be in a movie? Okay. And then they tipped him five bucks and sent him on his way. And they, and there's mistakes that are left in. Like, it sounds like they did everything in one take and didn't fix anything, like the, the line where it goes like, Must be some torp of bonus. No, don't, don't, uh, don't bother going back and fixing that. Yeah, just leave that in. Nobody will notice. And there's uh, scenes of people, it's like the voice actors, you can, you can hear them forgetting their lines and stepping over each other's lines, which I don't even know how you do in animation. But uh, yeah, the only, the only one who seems like they're giving like half of a shit is the girl who dubbed the robot doll which is a shame because she's voicing by far the most annoying character in the movie and uh yeah it's another one where in addition to the voice acting not giving a shit it's also one of those movies where everything about it they don't give a shit they're just trying to get a couple of bucks hoping people think this is tron and the you know there's Tons of plot inconsistencies, like when they first see the guy where he's got his brain hooked up to the computer and they, they literally say, well, you can only put your mind into a computer, you can't actually transport your body, and then everybody's bodies get transported, because fuck you. Like, why even, if you're going to do that, why even have the line, like, why put in, your bodies can't go in, if you're just going to have the bodies go in a couple seconds later. And then there's a... Uh, Black John in his race car, or race card as some people heard it. Uh, he's set up as the bad guy and he's chasing the hero through the whole thing. And there's a part where they're driving through the desert and then all of a sudden they're friends. Like, I don't, I didn't exaggerate anything in the video. It's literally, uh, the main guy goes down to an oasis to get a drink. Black John follows him there, looks at him like, like this, and then suddenly they're friends. And then at the end of the... <laughs> At the end of the movie, when Black John gets killed, the hero lets out a no, and yeah, that's after they've been friends with each other for 
15 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever of the movie's runtime. So, and speaking of which, that's the one, I guess, good thing I can say about it is that it's short. I think it's only like an hour and 15 minutes or an hour and 20 minutes or something. But it was a very, very annoying hour and 20 minutes. <sighs> Number seven, Mystery on Monster Island. Okay, um, this movie was directed by a guy called uh, Juan Piquer Simone. He's a Spanish director, and he's made uh, some horror movies like uh, Slugs and uh, Pieces, if you've heard of that one. And his horror movies are actually pretty entertaining. They're still technically terrible. Like, they're not objectively good movies, but they're entertainingly bad movies. Um, that's one side of Juan Piquer Simone. The other side is the guy who makes a bunch of kids' movies, and... His kids' movies drive me fucking bananas. <laughs> like, they are just insufferable. Um, there's another one he did where it's called, I think it's like the, the Wonderful Journey to the Center of the Earth or the Fantastic Journey to the Center of the Earth or something like that. It's something about Journey to the Center of the Earth. And that's another one where I've thought about doing it. It's just I put it off because it means I, I'll have to actually sit through it. But it's one of those movies that somehow magically manages to be both boring and obnoxious. And that also applies to this movie. And a common excuse people make for movies like this is they go like, well, it's a kid's movie. What do you expect? Okay, this is a movie, this is a movie that treats your kids like they're stupid. Like that's what, that's what shitty kids movies do. And that's what this movie does. The epitome of that is the professor character because he's supposed to be the comic relief of the movie. And what his comic relief consists of is he screams and that's it. He just, he sees stuff and he screams and that's, that's all they do. There's no funny lines. There's no funny situations. There's no actual jokes. It's just the professor screams and they're, I'll bet you in the script it was probably just like the professor screams and they were like, there, that's all I have to do because this is a kid's movie and kids are stupid and that's going to be enough to entertain them. It's like, it's like dangling your keys in front of them in the hopes that that'll be enough. And, and on top of that, it's a monster movie, which, you know, I, I watch a lot of cheesy monster movies. I can, I can enjoy a good cheesy monster movie. Even the monsters in this are... You know, not only do they look like shit, but they also don't use them well. Like, uh, uh, At the Earth's Core, that had a lot of goofy, weird monsters in it, but they actually used them for stuff. There's, you know, the part where Doug McClure fights that thing in an arena. You've got a fire-breathing frog, and, you know, Doug McClure throws a rock at it, and Peter Cushing shoots it with arrows, and it falls down a cliff and explodes. Here, they just, they sort of lumber around... The professor looks at him and screams, because that's all he fucking does in the movie, and they run away and just lather, rinse, repeat. That's all the monsters do. And then it has that super, super lame twist at the end, where it's revealed that none of the none of the monsters are real, none of the stuff on the island is real. It's all just like a a prank set up by the guy's uncle to teach him a lesson about I don't even I don't even remember. I don't even I don't even know if he needed a lesson to be taught about anything, but I guess this guy bought an entire island and filled it with fake monsters to show him. So, yeah, the monsters are fake, which is such a lame, dumb twist. And it's also a twist where they don't even do anything with it. There's, you know, they could have had it so that, okay, um... Because there is one real thing on the island. It's uh, Terrence Stamp and his, like, uh... I don't know if they're pirates or whatever they are. They're actually real. They're actually bad guys, and they're actually after the main characters. Once they learn that the monsters are fake and set up by his uncle, you, you'd think, well, maybe they can use the monsters to trick Terrence Stamp and scare him away. Nope, they don't do anything. Like, once they say the monsters are fake, that's it. They're just not in the movie anymore. And the, reason, the way they stop Terrence Stamp at the end is... Uh, the guy's uncle, played by Peter Cushing, who wasn't in the movie nearly enough, because Peter Cushing usually can make a movie better, but even he couldn't save this piece of shit. Um, <laughs> Peter Cushing comes in, and that saves the day. So it's just, I have a feeling, this also goes back to what I was saying, like treating kids like they were stupid. I have a feeling, I didn't see this movie until recently, this was a, this was a Patreon request, but I have a feeling that even if I had seen this one when I was a kid, I think I still wouldn't have liked it. Um, I think that 
the kid version of me probably would have also been pissed off by that twist that the monsters are fake. So, yeah, just this was a really, really frustrating uh, sit. And oh, and, and there's also that stupid Chinese stereotype that's in there. The, the miserable Chinese wants to go home. Oh, my God. Ugh, talks like he stepped out of a fucking 1940s cartoon. This movie was made in the 80s, and they still put that in there. Oh, my God. Ugh. Yeah, fuck this movie. Uh... Number six. Ape. Yeah, that's right. Ape is number six. That should tell you a lot about this list. Um, this is another one that was on my old list, so I'm probably going to keep this pretty short. But uh, there's, there's one good thing about this movie. It's got, admittedly, one of the best images in bad movie history, which is when the gorilla goes like this, gives the finger to the camera. That part's hilarious. If the rest of the movie had been like that, I might have liked it in a so bad it's good sort of way. But again, most of it is just boring. Nothing happens. There's, I think, the the colonel or general or whatever, I think he's in the movie more than the ape, and it's just him pretending to talk on the phone to people. And even when the ape is on screen, most of the time he's not doing anything. He's stepping over a plastic cow or... Um, you know, people are pretending to throw spears at him because it was supposed to be in 3D and because the movie was so low budget and they can't show him, they can't show the ape and people together, it just shows the ape kind of looking at people like, ugh, and not, and not doing anything. And it's just, this is another one where you can tell that this was just a completely lazy cash grab movie that they made as cheaply and quickly as possible just some of the lowest production values you can possibly imagine. The the gorilla costume looks like something they picked up at a fucking Spencer Gifts or whatever. You know, you can actually see the... I think there's parts where you can see the glove of the suit and then the rest of it's here and you can see the guy's arm through it. And the, you know, scenes where he's fighting a snake where it's literally the guy just grabs a snake, throws it at the camera, hits the camera, can't do a second take because that would take more time and time is money. And we want to spend as little as possible on this thing. And just, yeah, they should have, um, an alternate title for this was Attack of the Horny Gorilla, which is a much schlockier, more entertaining title than the actual movie. If it had actually lived up to that title and the gorilla, you know, giving the finger. If it had actually been like that, if it had actually been a little more self-aware and just tried to play more things for laughs, I probably would have liked it better. But for now, here's what I think of it. Uh... Number five. The Shape of Things to Come. Oh, Canada. Um... I said at the beginning of my exploitation a thon video, Canada's made some good uh, sci-fi movies. You know, we got Videodrome, we have Heavy Metal, uh, some horror movies like Black Christmas, and then we have pieces of shit like this thing. And why this movie is so bad is a little hard to explain, because I say this in the video, it's all the elements of it like the effects and the storyline they're bad but they're not the they're not the worst i've seen like i've definitely done movies with worse effects worse acting worse uh, plots plots that make less sense but there's something it's almost like they get every ingredient just right to come together in one big stew of just shit um, <laughs> This is one, and this is another one that was meant to cash in on Star Wars. Um, at least with this one, you can tell that's what it was supposed to be right from the beginning. So I guess it has that going for it. But it has all the things like, it, you know, it has the cute robot that makes a bunch of bad jokes. Like, uh, I can't remember the line, but people are saying like, let's go get something to eat. And the robot goes, nothing for me, please, because robots don't eat. Pretty wacky. Ugh. And... Again, a lot of it, um, there's not even any funny, like, funny bad moments with the exception of when uh, Jack Palance gets hit on the head at the end with a piece of styrofoam, which is, that that one's hilarious, that's hilarious just because it was clearly an accident. I don't know if Jack Palance, like, lipped off to some of the crew or anything like that, 
But uh, yeah, the fact that they kept that in the movie <laughs> is pretty funny. It's and yeah, it seems it seems like kind of a fuck you to Jack Palance. So I don't know. Again, I don't know if he did anything. But uh, yeah, that's the one like entertainingly bad moment in it. The rest of it, again, it's another one of those plots where barely anything happens. Uh, there's not even any space battles in it. Like there's a part where uh, they're going to the bad guy's planet and they see one of his ships and they say like, should we? It's something like, should we fire missiles or something like that? And then they goes like, no, there's nothing we can do. Oh, okay, thanks for that. Remember remember at the end of Star Wars where the Death Star was approaching and they were like, well, guess there's nothing we can do, and then the movie just ended? Remember that? Remember how, remember how fun that was? And some people are probably saying, well, they didn't have a lot of money. You know what? Star Crash didn't have a lot of money. They still had space battles. They still had stuff happening. It was, it was cheesy, but, I mean, it was, it was entertaining. Like, at least I... At least I actually kind of gave a shit about what was going on in that movie. Star Crash is an example of how you do a cheesy Star Wars knockoff that's actually fun and entertaining. This movie is an example of how you do a Star Wars knockoff that is just boring as fuck. Uh... Number four. Story of Chinese Gods. Uh... I don't know what it is about these animated movies, but they, this and Korean Tron were really, they really cranked up the obnoxiousness. This was a, this is another Patreon request, and yeah, I had a hard time getting through this. Um, this is, um, technically more happens in it than in Korean Tron, but it's like, it's annoying stuff. It's like, it's like a it's like an acid trip, but not in a good way. It's like you took a shitload of brown acid to Woodstock and you don't know what the hell is going on. Um, and it's, yeah, again, maybe it's because the version I watched was dubbed into English. Maybe that has something to do with why I didn't enjoy it. But yeah, it's another one of those movies where the voice acting is absolutely terrible. It sounds like no one gives a shit about anything. The actors are, again, you can, it sounds like they're forgetting and stepping on each other's lines in a cartoon. And I still don't really know what the hell happened in it. Like, I don't know what the plot was. People told me that it's apparently based off of a Chinese myth, but it's a Chinese myth that's, uh, I don't know if it's like nine volumes or nine books. It's super long. Like, it's something that you couldn't do in one movie and this tried to condense everything down into like 90 minutes or 80 minutes or however long, however long it is, which would explain a lot. Because, yeah, it, it's, it's almost like there's just... There's just images happening. Like, it's just Bruce Lee's fighting a snake, and then he gets swallowed by it, and then he starts drop-kicking its intestines, and then it explodes, and then there's flying fox heads, and then a guy's head detaches, and then a guy, a eagle guy grabs it, and then there's ogres in there for some fucking reason. It's, yeah. I'm... I'm thinking back on it right now, and I still am not entirely sure what I watched. But one thing I do know is, now that I'm done the video, I don't want to watch it again. Uh... Number three, Bigfoot. Now, when I mentioned at the beginning that the worst thing a movie can be is boring, I think this one epitomizes that more than any other, because, um... This is a movie where, yeah, I think you could describe the events in probably like one or two sentences. Um, it, there's a lot of driving, there's a lot of walking, and there's a lot of talking about what's happening, even though barely anything <laughs> happened in it. And it's also another, another thing that really pisses me off about this movie is that it's, I hate exploitation movies that don't even have the balls to exploit anything. Like, this is a movie that should be, uh, you know, sleazy, it should be violent, it should have, there should be nudity in there. Um, a, good, a good example of a movie that does what this movie should have done is uh, I Drink Your Blood. I think that was made the same year, but that's, it's got a sleazy, sensationalistic story. There's gore, there's sex. It's all the stuff you want in a really terribly made drive-in movie. And this is like, if you took that, if you took... Uh, a shitty drive-in movie with all the bad acting and all the low production values, but then took out all the fun exploitation stuff. And 
there's a G-rated exploitation movie is one of the worst things to sit through in the world. And this is a movie that, yeah, the, the poster and uh, DVD cover for this promises way more than the movie delivers. It shows, uh, shows Bigfoot lifting a police uh, motorcycle over its head. Doesn't happen in the movie. There's no, the most violence we get is at the end, somebody shoots uh, one of the Sasquatches in the knee and there's like a little bit of blood. That's it. Um, a good example of a movie that does, uh, like a sleazy exploitation Bigfoot movie that does it right is Night of the Demon. Um, well, okay, let me rephrase that. It gets it half right. The stuff with Bigfoot, that is actually good. Um, that's actually entertaining and violent. It's like, it's basically about Bigfoot going around killing people. It's like a, it's like an 80s slasher movie, but instead of Jason Voorhees or Michael Myers, it's Bigfoot going around killing people. Um, the stuff with the humans, that's still really boring, but yeah, the Bigfoot scenes are great. I actually have a copy of that movie. I should maybe review that in the future, but yeah, he's, Bigfoot stabs people with pitchforks. He, he pulls a guy's dick off when he's pulling, when he's uh, taking a piss. Um, there's, yeah, it's just a completely insane, gory, Bigfoot horror movie, and that's what this movie should have had, and it, there's just nothing. On the, on the poster it says breeds with anything. It breeds with nothing in this movie. There's no, um, even, even, uh, that, uh, Night of the Demon actually does, uh, Bigfoot gets a girl pregnant in that movie. Uh, I really should do that movie in the future. Um, yeah, this is... This is how bad Bigfoot is. I'm talking about Night of the Demon more than that movie because, yeah, there's nothing to talk about in it. There's hardly anything happens. You know you're in trouble when uh, John Carradine's in it and he's clearly slumming for a paycheck, yet he still gives the most watchable performance in it. Um, he's, he's not good, but he's at least okay. Like, he at least gives something sort of resembling a performance. Everybody else is like they just ate a ate a handful of quaaludes and then, you know, the camera started rolling. Like, there's just no effort to anything here. So, yeah, unless you find people walking and driving exciting, avoid this one at all costs. <sighs> Number two, Queen Kong. Yeah, you knew this one was gonna be on here, didn't you? Um, there are a few things worse in this world than a comedy that isn't funny and wow does this movie ever epitomize that it's just there i didn't laugh at a single joke in this movie i was either like this like just just stone-faced or i went like oh my god are you fucking kidding me did you actually just do that um i compare it to the uh the seltzer friedberg like you know the disaster movie or uh, meet the Spartans like those movies. It's not quite that shameless. It's slightly better than those, but it's I feel like this would be like the closest 1970s equivalent to those because it's just a parody movie where they're already parodying King, King Kong because of the remake that was coming out, but then they just throw in a bunch of references to other popular movies at the time just just cuz. Like they're just there to be references and there's no actual jokes behind them. Like, one example is, uh, they're on the boat, and some women are dancing, and Robin Asquith says, like, wow, they seem possessed, and then their heads start turning around, because the exorcist was a thing, remember that? And there's also a part where, again, they're on the boat, and then, like, a, this big rubber shark comes over, but it's got lipstick on, and I think it's, like, an apron that says Lady Jaws. Okay, that's literally the end of the scene. Like, the shark comes onto the boat, says Lady Jaws, scene. Onto the... <laughs> On to the next thing. And yeah, just shitty puns like the So That's Guerrilla Warfare, like the the sigh I make in the video, that's pretty much what I made in uh, in real life when I first watched it. And uh, other jokes where, uh, just jokes that, that you think that could lead to some sort of wacky, surreal stuff, but they just do nothing with them like the uh, prehistoric bagpipe one, they went to the trouble to actually make something. It doesn't look very good, but they made it. Um, and if, if this was like a Monty Python sketch, that they, they might have actually done something kind of creative and funny with it. With this one, it's just there so they can make a we'll take the high road, you'll take the low road joke. Because get it? Bagpipe, Scottish, that's a Scottish saying. 
Ha ha ha. Oh my god, this fucking movie was bad. And it's, you know, you know a movie is bad, you know a comedy is bad when even the special effects piss you off. Because normally in a comedy, especially one that's parodying monster movies, uh, having bad special effects actually helps. It's actually funnier if things look, look like shit. With this one, not only are these some of the worst looking dinosaurs and monsters I've ever seen, but they don't even they don't even help the humor at all like they actually i was actually angry at how bad these things looked um oh man yeah this was this was really insufferable and robin asquith who's the he plays the main character in it he says that he regrets being in it and this is a guy whose whole thing was in the 70s he was in dumb british sex comedies so this isn't a guy with like really high standards and even he was like Ugh, what was i thinking with this one and, uh, yeah, the only way I could recommend this is, uh, if you thought She's the Queenie for My Weenie was funny, then maybe you'll like this, but for everybody else, stay away. Uh... And number one. Star Crash 2, or Escape from Galaxy 3, or Return of the Jedi 4, or whatever the fuck this thing is called. I, I really thought a long time about this one because this and uh, Queen Kong were kind of neck and neck for being number one, and honestly, if I made this list on another day, I, I might have switched them around. Because, uh, yeah, they're, they're both just terrible, but for now, this one kind of... This one kind of just hits that magic sweet spot of being boring and also just stupid and obnoxious. Um, it's another movie where it's, you know, even though it's called Star Crash 2, it has nothing to do with the first Star Crash, even other than it uses stock footage from it. That's it. It uses, yeah, it uses stock footage from a Star Wars knockoff. And then the rest of it is just, it's another one of those movies where practically nothing happens in it. There's uh, the two main characters, Bellstar, and then I, I can't remember the guy's name, but uh, their planet gets blown up by the bad guy. They go to another planet, which we learn is Earth in the, in the I can't remember if it's the past or the post-apocalyptic future. That's how bad this is. I blocked out most of, most of the plot. Um, but they, yeah, they go to Earth. They just wander around for a little bit and, again, basically don't even do anything. Um, and then the natives there tell them to leave. The bad guy gets there. The end. And there's just so much filler. The uh, epitome of that is the shot. And they use it twice. They use it when uh, they're leaving the spaceship where they go down the ramp. They go this way down a mountain. Then they go this way. Then they go this way, and then when they're running back to their ship, they go up the whole way, and they show the entire thing. And the shots, both shots, they're two minutes long, and they don't cut away from them either time. Like, like talk about trying to pad out the runtime. And again, there's nothing, there's nothing funny about it. There's nothing, there's nothing. Uh, entertainingly bad about it the closest i guess is the bad guy because he kind of looks like george clinton that's it and uh one of the one of the alternate titles for this is like erotic games in the third dimension or something kind of implying that it's like a sleazy sort of uh sexual sci-fi movie but even that there's a little bit of nudity like there's like a scene where uh, the main character is like by a waterfall doing like a shampoo commercial sex scene that's it like even in even on that front it doesn't deliver this is a movie that just doesn't deliver anything there's no nothing interesting with the plot no interesting characters it's not funny it's not sexy it's just boring and obnoxious so it, this was number one on my last list and it's number one on this list as well um maybe when i update this again i don't know if i'll do it at 150 episodes or if i'll wait until i get to 200 episodes if I make it that far, but yeah, um, 100 episodes in and this movie is still number one. So we'll see if it can hold on to that record. So yeah, thanks for watching. Uh, I'm also going to be doing a best movies list pretty quick and uh, I'm also working on some more reviews. 
So until then, I will see you all later.